So hello and welcome everyone to this very special event marking the beginning of a new contemporary history and politics research group here at York St John University. My name is uh, Anne-Marie Evans and I am the Head of School for Humanities here at York St John and I'm very, very happy to welcome everyone joining us online today, including our guest of honour, Lord Kinnock. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Just a few items of housekeeping before we get started. We will be taking questions, so you can pop your question into the chat using the Q&A button down at the bottom of your, street, your screen, and I will be keeping an eye on the questions as they come in. And we have got transcripts turned on for accessibility reasons, but if you want to turn them off, you could also do so on your own settings. So today, Lord Kinnock will be talking with my colleagues, Dr. Jim Cooper, the Associate Professor of History and American Studies, and my other colleague, Dr. Chris Kirkland, who is a lecturer in politics. And they'll be talking to Lord Kinnock about his career at the front line of British politics and the Labour Party's past, present and future. And as I am sure you are all aware, Lord Kinnock was first elected to the House of Commons in 1970. In addition to serving his constituency with distinction, he was leader of the Labour Party and, of course, leader of the opposition from 1983 until 1992. As Labour leader, Lord Kinnock made an enormous contribution to British political life. He held the Conservative governments of Margaret Thatcher and John Major to account on issues that impacted national life and Britain's role in the world. In the 1987-1992 general election, Lord Kinnock's leadership saw Labour increase its electoral support and number of MPs, therefore ensuring that the Labour Party of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown had a strong foundation to achieve an electoral landslide in 1997. After stepping down as Labour leader in 1992, Lord Kinnock served as a European Commissioner, including five years as a Vice President of the European Commission. He remains an active contributor to and an important voice in the Labour Party and in British politics more general. So thank you, Lord Kinnock, for joining us today and a very, very warm welcome from everyone here at York St John University. I am now going to hand over to my colleagues, Jim and Chris, and I'm going to turn my camera off while you are having this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Kinnock. It's good to see you. And um, I think how I'd suggest we, we, we do this now is that I have a couple of questions to ask you, if that's OK. And then Fine. Chris will have, have a two or three questions, too. And then we'll open up the floor, the, the virtual floor um, to other people who are in attendance. And we have a, we have you know, so 75 people in attendance today. So uh, so this is a, a very, very um, well attended, uh, extraordinary event. So, OK, so Lord Kinnick, if I may, I think in some ways the question which perhaps politicians aren't always asked but why did you join the Labour Party and why did you devote your life to the Labour Party? Um, mm, um, I guess it goes back into the 1950s and the place, the area, the community in which I was brought up which was Tredegar in South East Wales, what was then Monmouthshire and I came from a family who were confirmed socialists and trade unionists, but not uh, party activists. Uh, and they never rammed any kind of politics down my throat. But in the natural ebb and flow of uh, family conversation, um, there were frequent political references, day-to-day -day current affairs. Um, they were an articulate bunch. My mother and father were very well read, uh, despite, um, in my father's case, leaving school at 13, in my mother's case, uh, leaving the grammar school, uh, simply because of dire poverty, uh, when she was 16. And um, the wider community also uh, made me understand by the time I was, I don't know, maybe 11 or 12, that most of the good things that we had outside the family were a result of collective action and collective contribution. And that was everything from the swimming pool and the tennis courts to the Tredegar Workmen's Hall and the magnificent library and the rugby club and the choirs 
and the operatic society and everything that went with community life in industrial South Wales in the 1950s. And I guess that somehow as a kid, I connected up what I was hearing, not just in my family, but more widely and what I was seeing uh, and the, this feeling, which was pretty automatic and I think pretty widespread too amongst uh, my generation of needing improvement of advance and the understanding that if you worked hard enough and you were smart enough and you got qualifications, you would get on. And that to me meant getting on in terms of um, my own self-fulfillment, but also the area that I came from and the people that I came from. Uh, I was assisted by the fact that our member of parliament was an Aaron Bevan. And of course he was a glowing inspiration to my family, several of whom had worked with him in, in the colliery in Tredega, in the Potin colliery, um, and also in Tetrist, the pit across the river from where I was brought up. And I call it the river, it's a stream really. <laughs> and, um, but like the, the River Jordan gets exaggerated. Um, so by the time I was 14, um, I asked the local ward secretary, who was our county councillor, Billy Harry, a good friend of the family, um, if I could join the Labour Party. And he said, I couldn't until I was 15, but I badgered him until he allowed me to join on the 1st of January, 1956, which was actually, um, uh, sorry, 57, which was uh, uh, three months before my 15th birthday. So it's that combination of consciousness, experience, ambition for our kind of people, um, and the fact that collective action and contribution was the practical, self-evident way for that to occur. And the Labour Party represented those purposes. Well, thank you. And as a, and a, 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 Evan, and a, another fantastic uh, figure. Um, basically, obviously, you took these values. Well, fortunately, these fortunately, he wasn't fantastic. He was realistic. <laughs> and uh, he had nothing to do with fantasy. <laughs> Although his imagination was endless, of course. Um, yeah, so obviously, but of the values you're talking about, the philosophy you're talking about, those are the, the things you, you took into um, politics and you spoke up for, you advocated as Labour leader. And I was just wondering if you could tell us about the experience of being leader of the opposition, because in some ways it must be the most difficult and thankless job in British politics. And obviously you were, as leader of the opposition, you were faced by a number of challenges in terms of, obviously perhaps internally, members of your own party, uh, the inheritance you'd had from previous elections. Um, you're opposing uh, Margaret Thatcher, who perhaps in the in the second term was almost at her zenith um, in terms of her own confidence and so on, before perhaps she went on to more hubris into her third term. And of course, there were also the media as well. Um, the media is very hostile as well. So could you just talk about your how you approached being leader of the opposition and what your priorities were and how you were trying to fix things for Labour and then obviously in turn the, the country. Well, you described the multiplicity of the challenges and uh, they were self-evident. You could add in the existence of the Social Democratic Party, which by splitting the vote, the anti-conservative vote in 1983 had produced a, a gigantic landslide in the first past the post system for Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and that was another front on which we had to fight. In addition to those you've listed, most of the others, the divisions uh, which were deep and bitter in the Labour Party, the relative strength of Thatcher um, post the Falklands and the 1983 victory, um, and the general condition of the country. 
which was somewhere between dire and disastrous, uh, substantially as a result of the application of Thatcher's ideology. And she was very deliberately served at the time, of course, by a chancellor of the Exchequer, Geoffrey Howe, and uh, who became an agent of a downfall. Uh, but at the time, in the early 1980s to the mid 1980s, um, they were dominant. Uh, so consequently, I can honestly, have to repeat myself, um, things I've said on a previous occasion, I can date my midlife crisis precisely from five o'clock on the afternoon of October the 2nd, 1983, uh, to four o'clock on the afternoon of July the 18th, 1992. It was hideous, bloody awful. Uh, there were occasional reliefs of advances, triumphs, great by-elections, wins, uh, great performance in the, uh, in the European Parliament elections and so on. Uh, wonderful people that I met and some bloody stinkers that I met. Um, but they didn't compensate for the uh, general drudgery of uh, having to fight on. Um, and I, I guess the word drudgery really uh, enlightened by the odd flash of success or delight in meeting some of the greats, um, Mandela, Gorbachev, and um, you know, other people that I met in various places around the world. Um, and uh, that lightened the darkness, but mainly it was pretty bleak, especially when by the time of the general election in 1992 uh, and the change of conservative leadership, I realized that our greatest electoral asset uh, had gone through the door in November 1990 when Thatcher was toppled, substantially due to the fact that we'd had double figure poll leads for months before and great by-election successes. So in addition to the divisions in the Conservative Party and the lunacy of the poll tax, um, we helped to contribute to getting rid of Thatcher, but it did deprive us of, uh, as I say, a great electoral asset. She was replaced by John Major and uh, nothing and no one could have uh, given the impression of not being Margaret Thatcher, which was his greatest asset, uh, as he, in private conversations, subsequently recognized. And by the second week of the election campaign in 92, therefore, I knew we weren't quite going to make it. The result was very narrow, but very narrow uh, is not good enough. So, you know, that was the whole experience as rapidly as I can sum it up. But do you not take any any heart or any satisfaction from the fact that actually you took perhaps Labour from um, a very low point in 1983 until the, the cusp of victory in 92, which kind of did, you know, did lay the groundwork for, for um, the 97 successes. The fact you did actually remove Thatcher. Um, which obviously you wanted to, but not in the way perhaps you'd hoped to, but um, there was actually some things to, it's a lot of drudgery, you did, 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 did actually accomplish a great deal as leader of the opposition, though you didn't get the, the keys to number 10, in, if you will, in the end. Yeah, um, well, uh, when 97 came and that magnificent landslide victory, um, people were very kind, including Coney and Gordon in repeatedly attributing that victory uh, to what I'd done so obviously as a human being. I took some uh, comfort and satisfaction from that. Um, and I did know that by 1992, I'd changed what was a financially bankrupt party, or organizationally shambolic party, um, a confused party ideologically, uh, and the party with um, policy stances that were in some cases wrong and in other cases simply unsaleable 
to the electorate. And I knew that I changed all that, but patently I hadn't done enough of it. And in addition, of course, uh, I recognized, as I said to my colleagues, that whilst the changes in terms of organization, constitution, policy, finance, all those other things, personnel were vital, they did invite the charge from the Tories that the changes were cosmetic and superficial and made for opportunistic reasons. And that really behind this pleasant, outward going, hail fellow well met, good neighbor um, personality that they attributed to me, <laughs> um, there was a skulking radical left-wing socialist who would institute uh, all kinds of tumultuous change and massive tax increases if I got elected. Now, of course, that was all complete bloody garbage, but nevertheless, uh, the very fact of change invited the attack of inconstancy, of lack of fidelity to fundamental beliefs. And I don't think that made a hell of a difference at the election but it could make some difference in enabling me and the Labour Party that we changed to be represented uh, as a cosmetic alteration. Um, so uh, that's where we were. I did take satisfaction from the changes that we made. They were absolutely vital. They did set the Labour Party on a new course, which eventually was triumphant. And I was very proud of the Labour government and most of its activities between 97 and 2010. Uh, but of course, when your purpose is to win the cup, simply getting the loser's medal is not much bloody good. Thank you, Lord Gunnick. And anyway, I, I can't monopolise our time. I'll have to uh, discipline myself. So uh, I'll hand over to my colleague, Chris uh, Kirk, now, if I may, so if we ask some questions for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Lord Kinnock. I'd, I'd like to pick up on, on some of those points about the uh, changes in, in the party, uh, if I may. And one thing that, that comes out in, in the 1980s, uh, which, of course, isn't founded in the 1980s, but has a much longer history, is the tension between the party's uh, NEC and the party membership. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and we can think of this in terms of tensions over uh, one member, one vote, uh, for example. I wonder if you could say a bit about how much of an impact that tension had upon yourself as leader of the party and how well uh, you think the Labour Party have managed that uh, post uh, your, your time as leader, in, uh, leader of the party, please. Well, the divisions over policy and the tensions over the conduct of the party, um, which you rightly describe, um, were a massive distraction, but they couldn't be overlooked or avoided. I'm getting feedback. Is that a, can you hear me clearly? Hello? Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. we, can, we can hear you, Lord Kinnock. Okay, fine. I was getting feedback, so I was wondering uh, if you were hearing me. Sorry. Um, so you identified the fact that there were significant tensions over conduct of the party, rules of the party, as well as over policies. Uh, just a word on policies. In politics, as you will understand, uh, some policy stances develop almost religious significance. Uh, people uh, don't just embrace a policy, uh, the articulation of that policy becomes part of their code of belief. And that's particularly true in the Labour Party, or certainly was then, of unilateral nuclear disarmament and nationalization. Uh, in addition, the close and absolutely vital relationship between the party and its affiliated trade unions uh, led to um, a set of categoric beliefs 
in the sanctity of trade unionism and the way in which it had been conducted for the previous 20, 30, 50 years. So in making change, it was obvious to me then, and it became more obvious to other people, that we had to secure a shift, not only in endorsement of policies, but in many cases across the party, in the rank and file membership and in the trade unions, an alteration in mindset so that people embrace the rationale behind policy change as well as the change itself. And of course, that constitutes a really difficult task because you've got to evangelize about the alternative and make the uh, case for change while respecting reasons, the reasons that people have for holding what had become beliefs and not just policy stances. So they were amongst the difficulties. The tension, um, you said, between the NEC and the membership, that was never the tension because at a period of time between about 1977 and 1985, the National Executive Committee substantially reflected the uh, membership votes on those issues of policy. And uh, that segment of the National Executive Committee, which until 1985 was actually in a majority, I could never count up until that time on a majority victory for any proposition I made to the National Executive Committee. So for about six or seven years, the NEC was pretty hostile to the leadership, whether Callahan, Foot, or myself. And of course, that hostility was led by the highly articulate and charming Tony Benn. Uh, he had support from a breadth of sentiments and ideologies, including the militant tendency and people who think of themselves as the adventurous ultra-left and actually a, a source of wounding uh, and, and weakness for the Labour Party, although they think the absolute opposite. Uh, anyway, that confronted me and that's what made the business of change in constitution and organization and in policy much more gradual, much more arduous, much more time consuming than uh, would otherwise have been the case. I really had to undertake without dramatizing it, uh, house by house, line by line, word by word in every damn resolution um, combat. And eventually I managed by 1986 to get a fairly reliable majority of about two on the National Executive Committee, partly by improving the organization on the NEC of the affiliated union representatives and securing some victories in the constituency section and in the affiliated organizations. So I managed to put together out of the 31 members of the executive, about 16, 17, who were more or less dependably on my side. I increased that in the subsequent years um, so that by 92, I had a comfortable majority of about four or five on the National Executive Committee. But that was a very absorbing, time-consuming uh, part of my task. And of course, my main task should have been fighting the Tories and beating them <laughs> and developing policies that had relevance and resonance among a breadth of the public because obviously the advance of the Labour Party of democratic socialism in the United Kingdom depends upon breadth of appeal across the electorate. And 
what we weren't able to do was to secure sufficient breadth. And part of the reason for that, and I'm not looking for excuses, it is patently and analytically a reason, is that I had to spend a hell of a lot more of my time and energy and public portrayal focusing on getting the Labour Party into condition where it could credibly fight and win elections. Um, and so uh, the, the tension between the party generally and the executive uh, wasn't significant. The fact that there was a degree of coherence between them was, for me, uh, a nuisance and distraction that had to be dealt with. And it took enormous amounts of time, years. And inside those years, hours and endless hours in order to bring about the change. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. We, you mentioned the, uh, the trade unions and the relationship uh, with the, the, the trade union uh, movement as a whole. And this is, this is something that certainly in academic circles is described as a contentious alliance. This is a, a famous publication by uh, Lewis Minkin. Yeah. Uh, how do, do you feel that that's an accurate description? Do you, I, I know you've said a bit about this, but I wonder if I could just push you a bit more on this, certainly thinking I about. Think I, I, I know Lewis, or I knew Lewis and uh, admired his, his work. It was very painstaking and had good insights. I think the best description of the relationship between the affiliated unions and the Labour Party came from Jack Jones. Jack said back in the uh, late 60s, it's like a good marriage. Each partner thinks of murder sometimes, but divorce never. And I think that's the nature of the relationship. I actually managed partly because of a background in which I knew several of the trade union leaders when they were um, uh, industrial group leaders in trade unions, regional secretaries, uh, district secretaries. One or two of them were former students of mine when I used to work for the Workers' Education Association. So I was fortunate in having some personal relations as well as alliances in particular campaigns stretching from CND through to the Chile to Solidarity Campaign and the Industrial Democracy Movement. So I had a network of personal relationships that I could build on. In addition, there was a, a core of trade union leaders, uh, pragmatic, um, thought of uh, accurately in some cases, as politically right wing, uh, whose respect I managed to gain um, over a relatively short time after 83, none of them had voted for me. Uh, not even the ones who had conducted membership ballots and had been instructed by the membership to vote for me, they ignored it. But um, I, I got a large proportion of the trade union vote in the electoral college. Uh, a half of the PLP and overwhelming support from the CLPs. So I managed to build on these personal relationships and that core of non-left, I think that's the best way to describe them, trade union leaders, as well as a couple on the left who were very solid in the support of me. Moss Evans in the Transport and General Workers Union, Clive Jenkins in the Management Union, and uh, eventually, I got the public employees on my side as well uh, after 85, and uh, I developed that. Um, uh, the reason I give that background is uh, in conversation, I happened in uh, 1994, in the wake of his election as leader, to be on a long prearranged holiday with Tony Blair who had become a fortnight before we went to France, leader of the Labour Party. And of course, when we arranged that holiday, nobody'd ever 
thought of John, John Smith dying or anything like that. But naturally, our holiday, together with Alistair Campbell and Fiona, his partner, uh, Glenn's my wife, and uh, uh, Cherie Blair, um, we were all together with the kids and uh, uh, who are all our grandchildren's age. Uh, but the youngsters were with Ali and, and Tony, obviously. And we had a lovely time in Provence. Uh, but uh, every time we were together at lunch or dinner or walking around, um, the conversation intensively turned to the future and what the new leader of the Labour Party was going to do. And there was one conversation I remember uh, Tony said, well, what are the three things I've got to look out for? What, what have I got to deal with? And I said, uh, Birmingham, it could turn into you a uh, Liverpool, not because of Trotskyites, but because of uh, questionable conduct by some in the party. Fortunately, Albertang got elected leader of the Labour Group on Birmingham City Council, and he dealt with that brilliantly. He was straight down the line. He was bloody marvelous. Anyway, so that problem within a few months had dropped off the, uh, the list. Um, and I said, Scotland, because um, they will complain all the time, even when you're doing the right thing. And he said, oh, I can deal with Scotland. I went to school in Scotland. I said, you didn't. You went to Fetty's Academy in Edinburgh. That's not bloody Scotland. Anyway, we had a laugh over that. And I then said, and the unions. And all you've got to do, Tony, is to sustain uh, frequent, reasonably frequent contact with the leaderships, not to flatter them, uh, not to defer to them, but to make it clear that they have a relationship with you, which won't always be friendly, but will always be respectful and when you need it, supportive. And now Tony set out with that ambition and made a good job of it, but in the very nature of the pressures of government, that faded. And consequently, the relationship wasn't as well developed and warm by the turn of the century uh, as is necessary. Not because there's any sense of being patronized, or seeking the patronage of the affiliated trade unions, but because, first of all, they're significant even now in the United Kingdom. They were more significant then, certainly in numerical terms. But uh, in addition, um, there is an institutional unbreakable relationship and the unions need to be taken into account, even when their advice is being very firmly and publicly rejected. The last thing that you have to do with the membership of the party generally, with your shadow cabinet, with the NEC, and with the affiliated trade unions, is give the impression that they are an afterthought, or they don't count, or they're taken for granted. It's the same with the electorate, of course. And so consequently, um, that was the basis on which my relationships with the unions developed. And even when we hit rocky patches over our defense policy, for instance, uh, and I made it very clear that we were navigating a course and that wasn't going to be changed. And then uh, when we came forward with a package of industrial relations proposals, part of which accepted the continuation of some of what Thatcher had done. There were, uh, people were disturbed by that, but I made it clear to them that we were going to continue. This is what we were going to do. Our first obligation was to the general public uh, and they just had to deal with that. And to be fair to them, they did uh, with um, great effectiveness. So that's the nature of the relationship. And it's very important that people understand it. As I said, no one has bettered Jack Jones's definition of the relationship, a good marriage, which sometimes contemplates 
homicide, but never divorce. That's, yeah, thank you, Lord Kinnick. That's a, a, a fantastic analysis and an overview of a of that, of that really provocative question about the relationship union. So I think now I think Chris will hand over to Anne Marie if that's okay to take questions from other attendees from our um, our meeting today. So okay, no. thank you for yep. answering uh, our questions. I'll hand over to Anne Marie and uh, and everybody else. Thank you, thank you. This has been a really fascinating discussion so far. It's great to see we've got some questions coming in here, uh, quite a few, but I wonder if we could start with one here um, about kind of the future of the Labour Party. So we have a question about if Labour are to garner enough electoral support to win a future national election, what do you think might be the key actions or policies required to engage or even re-engage with current and future voters. Thanks very much. Um, well, I think that Kia has got the right tone and the right pace of making increasingly clear our policy stances and why they relate directly uh, to the daily realities that people encounter, but also to their aspirations and hopes for the future. And I'd single out, for instance, the Green New Deal, which is absolutely vital, both because of the scale of commitment to investment in the development of modern and forward-looking industries, which of course includes some of our very established manufacturing, like steel and tool making and so on, I think that's vital. I think the commitment to the NHS, which combines substantial additional funding, which is vital, with modernization and reform to deal with the realities of altered demography, changing technology, new pharmaceutical miracles. Uh, I think that's very, very substantial. I think that the policy on immigration is extremely sound, is both very practical and humane. Uh, and I believe that uh, both Kia and Yvette Cooper could give greater prominence to what is a very practical and rational policy of decency that meets the needs of the country and deals with the appalling agonies of people who are desperate to get to the country. So I, there are three areas in which uh, I think uh, either great and increasing significance is being given or will be given and certainly should be given in order to resonate with the breadth of the electorate. If I had my own choice of uh, priority of, if you like, narrative, um, for the Labour Party, I would seek to get the Labour Party recognized right across all ages, all geographical areas, all socioeconomic groups, all people of all backgrounds, uh, graduate and non-graduate, old and young, north and south. I would try to get them to recognize Labour as the party for security. The reason I say that is that we live in an age of anxiety. I was 81 years of age yesterday, and I've been active in politics since I was 14, as I mentioned earlier, and very active, obviously, from university right through to becoming a young MP and so on and so forth. I have never known in all that time the scale and breadth of worry, anxiety, insecurity, in our society. And therefore, if Labour could make it clear that it is the party for security in terms of protection, health, social care, uh, combating crime, all these fundamentals of people's concerns, but also vitally, the party for enabling, using security as the springboard to advance, the party of opportunity, the party of enterprise, 
of creativity, of well-being, then I'm certain there would be a greater understanding of our central direction and sense of purpose. It would have real salience and people would relate to it because whether it's voiced or not, there is right across our society, this feeling of anxiety. In some cases, it's very immediate and personal. We have 4 million people in real poverty in Britain. But because of that, we've got 10 million more people who are worried about the prospect of dropping into that level of insecurity. And even those who are relatively secure in terms of housing, income, employment, education, the future, are concerned about the rest of society, which doesn't enjoy that relative security. So I'm, I'm certain if I had to choose an agenda or a, a, a heading, a narrative, if you like, a slogan, um, uh, a definition of purpose for a modern democratic socialist party, the Labour Party, I would try to ensure that people understood in every portfolio area, from housing to uh, employment, from employment to uh, training, from training to safety on the streets, from, you can see the whole activity, security for individuals, families, communities, which is crucial, the country, obviously important, and the planet, which is a matter of advancing and broadening concern. So I think the party for security um, as a way of bringing together, making more coherent, more cogent, the appeal which is being made on very solid policy grounds, affordable policy grounds by Keir Starmer and his colleagues at the moment, I think that would enhance our appeal and give us a strong, clear definition for our conduct in government. Thank you, thank you. Um, that, was a, that was a really detailed and generous answer. Um, just sort of following on from what you were saying there about this idea of the age of anxiety, which I think will, will really connect with a lot of people joining us online today. Um, we've got a group from um, Shrewsbury College, politics students, um, yep. who would like to ask you about the role of the media um, and its, you know, its role today and perhaps its role when, uh, you know, when you were sort of facing general elections. And they also, by the way, Lord Kinnett would like to wish you happy birthday for yesterday. So I'll just pass That's that off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did have a great birthday and topped it off last night by going with most of my family to see Guys and Dolls. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> I mean, and it's a terrific production. I've seen it before several times and it's always been good, a national theater and um, the old Vic. And, but last night in the national theater in the bridge, it was sensational. Sorry, sorry, that's a distraction. No, that's, we, we love theater tips, thank you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Shrewsbury College wants to know about the press. Um, the press, the written press, is still more important in the United Kingdom in the shaping of political agendas and affiliations than most other countries in the world, most other democracies in the world. Uh, that's for all kinds of traditional reasons but also to do with the, um, I suppose what I could call the strategic understanding of the people who own and therefore direct the newspapers. It's very important to recognize that for decades past, uh, the United Kingdom press has been mainly owned by immensely rich and ambitious tax exiles. Um, I know they give us 
frequent lectures on what uh, patriotism means, but that doesn't amount to much when it comes to paying their taxes. Whether we're talking about the ownership of the male group uh, or Rupert Murdoch or uh, just about anybody in ownership of the tabloids, with the exception, of course, um, of, uh, uh, of the Miller newspapers and the people and so on. So uh, because they are immensely rich and consequently powerful, and because they're ambitious, uh, which they don't disguise, um, they want to influence politics. In fact, one of the reasons for securing their ownership is directly to influence the direction of politics in our society. Uh, not simply for ideological reasons, but because it is immensely useful to them to have an influence over the nature and decisions, particularly of governments. The second thing that they understand, and I think that Rupert Murdoch showed particular genius in this, is that while people do buy newspapers for news, uh, both in the pre-electronic days, and very particularly now, they also buy newspapers to be entertained. And the overlapping between news presentation and entertainment is very substantial. Now, I'm not saying that they're patronizing their readership by giving them uh, flabby uh, celebrity stories, but an astounding amount of those newspapers is packed with coverage of absolute irrelevancy that has got no attraction other than literally entertainment and titillation. They can also present themselves, as Murdoch has successfully done, despite being a prime member of the establishment, as anti-establishment, because famous people, in the way they present it, whether they're in sport or politics or entertainment, showbiz, film, whatever else, celebrities, as we've come to know them, must have something to hide. Or they've got um, illicit liaisons, um, or they've got private lives, which are intriguing, uh, even though I frankly, like most people, I guess, couldn't really give a damn about them. But what it does is to sell large circulation newspapers, which is the foundation of very substantial income and great influence, especially if politicians defer to them or take them very fully into account or even set their standards and agendas by what the newspapers tell them they should. So that's why we've got the kind of media we've got. Now, of course, it's got terrific significance so far as broadcast uh, media is concerned for two reasons. One, a temperature is set, a climate is established by the uh, overwhelming uh, voice of newspapers. And secondly, and very importantly, the nature of opinion, phraseology, vocabulary, emphasis, use of adjectives is substantially determined by newspapers and contracted by broadcast media. So even when they are striving to be balanced and nonpartisan and neutral, they are consciously or unconsciously reflecting what they've read 10 minutes or two days before in their newspapers. Not because they're stupid or lacking in intelligence, quite the contrary, these are very smart people, but simply because when that is the main diet of news and presentation, it's quite natural that the particular slant 
the particular nature of reporting influences the spoken word and the nature of the interview. So that's where we get our media from. I'm interested in where our media is going because there is now very substantial overlap between newspaper ownership and radio station ownership and television involvement in the obvious case of Sky, but um, it more broadly than that, the engagement, especially with the new channels, which either have substantial overlapping ownership with newspapers or indeed almost complete ownership by newspaper organizations or organizations that were established on the basis of newspapers. Now, some of those broadcasting channels are distinguished in their independence and the non-partisan approach that they have to the news. I commend them. But some, of course, are very deliberately, manifestly, self-confessedly uh, preaching from a pulpit. And they carry on doing that. We're not the United States yet. But the flow, the tendency, the pressure is in that direction. And it becomes a matter of alarm, really, to me, when we look at the use in politics, specifically, more widely in commerce, in advertising, in buying and selling, but more worryingly, in my view, in politics, with the use of analytics. The way in which uh, we've moved in 20, 30 years from a situation in which newspapers marketed themselves to try and get themselves through your uh, letterbox or to be bought off the newsstands through to using analytics to influence the nature as well as the direction of opinion. So for the young generation, I'm talking specifically to Salisbury, uh, sorry, to Shrewsbury College and its contemporaries, please be extremely vigilant about the use of analytics and the way in which that can be used by personal analysis of habits, consumption, attitudes to actually largely determine electoral outcomes. That would be lethal for our democracy, which is insecure in some ways as it is and can be made more insecure if the power and influence of those tax exiles who control much of the media, not all of it, certainly control most of the newspapers, not all of them, can translate itself into the use of the most up-to-date of means of influence, and that's uh, social media analytics. So be careful about that. Okay, thank you. Well, very sound advice uh, to end on for us all there. We are sadly out of time. In fact, we've gone a little bit over time. So thank you for staying with us. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Chris and Jim, for their excellent questions. And I'd like to thank our events team. Thank you to everyone who's joined us online today. We've had some great questions and I'm sorry we've not been able to get through all of them. And of course, the biggest thank you to you, Lord Kinnick. I think we could have all listened to you for uh, several more hours, to be perfectly honest, but thank you so much. Hey, I can make minutes sound like hours, love. <laughs> so, I'm sorry about that. No. Sorry for the long responses, but they were damn good questions, you say, yes. Oh no, that's wonderful. We, we really appreciate your time and the candor and generosity with which you've answered our questions. So thank you. Thank you to everybody at home for joining us. We'll be ending this session now, but remember if you're interested in more York St. John events, you can have a look at our website and sign up for our link to find out what else is going on. So thank you again to everyone. Thank you to Lord Kinnock especially and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.